Welcome to episode 126. Today we are talking to the CEO and co-founder of Drone Harmony, Martin Fuchsberger, and we are talking about the future of drones. We talk about building a team in the Ukraine and the investor landscape here in Switzerland. Make sure to stay tuned. Welcome everybody to episode 126 of the Startup Show. Today we are here at Microsoft and I'm very excited to talk to Martin Fuchsberger, the CEO and co-founder of Drone Harmony. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarvi. Martin, as you know, on the Startup Show, the first thing we always do on the show is that you get a minute and a half to talk to my audience to tell us who you are. Hello everybody, I'm Martin Fuchsberger. I'm 36 years old. I have studied here in ETH Zurich uh, computer science. I did my PhD there as well. Then moved to the industry, uh, corporate. So I was working for the Swiss Federal Railways to improve the efficiency of the rail traffic management system. So if you are in the train and you feel that uh, you don't have as much delays anymore, it might be related <laughs> to my work. I also did some work with Deutsche Bahn later on. And two years ago, I decided corporate life uh, is not for me anymore. It was too slow in innovation and I, I didn't like the challenge that I was faced daily. So I decided to move uh, into the startup world. I actually did this also already in the academia here in Zurich. Mm -hmm. I was in Venture Lab. It's very recommendable to do this if you're interested as an uh, entrepreneur to get in touch with entrepreneurial life. And yeah, I decided to, to create my own startup with, with two colleagues of mine. What's very fascinating about you, you did probably everything you can do. You were in software development, you were in corporate, you were in academia for over five years, and now you're doing startup. Tell us why startup? What, mm -hmm. what excites you about entrepreneurship? And like maybe, you know, a little bit of a comparison of all these different types of works. Yeah, so I, I would say all of them have their benefits and their excitement, but also their drawbacks. So academia was really interesting because I really like technical challenges, engineering, uh, looking at difficult problems, trying to solve them. Corporate, I think, was for me the choice to just get in touch with business, mm -hmm. to understand, you know, what is big corporation about um, how can you actually bring in stuff you learn in academia to uh, industry. But ultimately, the drawback there is you are dependent on the speed of the big corporations and sometimes decision processes can take quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So for me, I decided I want to be more innovative, uh, much more speedy, and uh, also make my own decisions. So <laughs> now I'm faced with uh, this uh, benefits, <laughs> but uh, the drawback is, you know, you are on your own, right? right. So, so you, you have to, each problem you face, you have to face your, uh, on your own. So let's not hold back our audience uh, from understanding what Drone Harmony does. So maybe give us a short pitch about like, what you guys do. Basically reinventing the way people are flying drones commercially. So we are addressing customers or pilots that go out there to do professional jobs with their drones. You might not know what are professional jobs for, for these pilots. Basically, they go out there to inspect infrastructure assets or to do surveying and mapping jobs. So they ask from their customer, and often these are big enterprises, some money to do some pictures, some videos of, of these assets. And often they have to pilot the drone themselves. And now this is not easy. You have basically two joysticks to control the drone. Mm -hmm. And in addition, you have to control the camera, the angle and so on. So it's, it's a quite a challenging task. And what we are doing is we are providing basically a Swiss army knife, a tool, that allows you to fly the drone autonomously and you can do this much easier and much safely and more with more uh, quality in the end. Sure. What I realized, um, what, what's pretty clear is like you are not providing the hardware, you are just doing the software, is mm -hmm. that correct? This is correct. We are <laughs> providing the software. So we are uh, basically using uh, drone hardware platforms to uh, control the drone with our software. Mm -hmm. So we are not producing the drones. Mm -hmm. So how come you decided, for example, to go with DJI um, as, a, as the, let's say, the base for, for your software? It's a, it's a good question and I have an anecdote here as well. So <laughs> two years ago when we started out, we actually looked at open source drones. Yes. And we built our own drones uh, from different parts and with, with all these things. And it took us just months to, to get the drone in the air and successfully. Mm -hmm running and it's just not something you can ask from any pilot that he builds his own system and so on. So then we decided we have to go to a drone that is pre-built and why DJI in this case? DJI really owns about 70% of the global market. It's a natural decision as a startup mm -hmm. to, to go with the biggest uh, market size uh, shareholder company. Sure. My challenge was while I'm preparing 
for this interview is you you on the one hand you're commercially, but then you're using a, a drone that is like more like for the average consumer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see, let's say, these standard, very simple to fly drones are being used commercially, or is that still like a hobby? I mean, DJI is well known, I know, from, from many people that fly drones on the weekend or on their yes. holidays. But they actually also manufacture platforms that are used by professionals. And it's confirmed when we talk to the industry, many of the professional service providers, so people that have pilots to fly these inspection shops, they tell us, we're actually using DJI platform, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So we really seldom get the request, mm, can you also support another drone? Because especially in the US, DJI is all over the place when it mm -hmm. comes to deploying professional drone hardware. Mm -hmm. So w when you look at, let's say, your first uh, clients or, or people using your software, what are the typical use cases of, of your software? We have been focusing on, on the first uh, industry, let's say, vertical uh, for us was telecommunication. So imagine uh, Swisscom that has a lot of cell towers and uh, in the world you have about 3 million cell towers mm -hmm. and you have to inspect them for maintenance reasons, so to see if there is some, some rust. But you also want to know exactly measurements so that you can decide in the office where do you put a new, new antenna. So the, basically the infrastructure owner really wants to know what's, what's on this tower and mm -hmm. what is the health of, of the antenna. It used to be that you have climbers going up there and Sadly enough, yeah. uh, every year you have deaths associated with this activity. So they are really interested in moving these kind of jobs towards using drones. Yeah. And they face the problem that the pilots have to be very skilled to, to fly around these towers and cover every angle. Mm -hmm. So they're interested in our solution. Mm -hmm. So what are, let's say, next steps when you say like more, now you're in telecom? What would be like other applications? So we have built a platform that allows us to quickly add new, mm -hmm. um, basically, industrial verticals. And what we are looking at at the moment is uh, wind turbines. It's very interesting because here time is also critical. Yeah. During the inspection, you have to shut down the wind turbine. So you want to be quick in executing your inspection task. Then we are looking basically at every uh, industry that has vertical structures. So bridges, railroad bridges, for mm -hmm. example, is a very interesting thing. In the US, the infrastructure is quite degraded. So a lot of these bridges are interesting actually to, to know now which ones should we do something about. Yeah. These areas are the main focus for now. But there are others, power lines, uh, oil and gas is a big topic. It's more about which one can we address quickly enough. Sure. <laughs> okay. um, you know, one of the key questions that investors usually ask in the mm -hmm. first uh, part of the due diligence process is how were you able to define your first product based on the product to market fit? Um, how did you make this evaluation whether what you are developing what was actually needed on the market? Mm -hmm. So we had basically two strategies. So the first one is we decided to very quickly produce a minimal viable product mm -hmm. and put this out there to get customer feedback. So we did this more than a year ago. We released our first product on the market, Google Android Play Store, mm -hmm. where everybody could download that uh, software and start using it for free and this helped us to get feedback and insights what are these people looking for what is missing what is not good yeah. so we could improve that and it was really a very well uh, decision to do this because this way we could improve and uh, basically build something that people actually are happy to use mm -hmm. and the other strategy we had is basically we engaged with industry service provider companies that are in contact with the end customer and that know exactly what do they need these end customers, what kind of pictures do they want. Mm -hmm. So they worked with us, basically they gave us their specifications of what flight planning software they would like to have yeah. and we built that and it was an iterative process and, and uh, so you can build a product this way. What I'm always curious to know is like, you know, when I, when I meet these, all of these different founders, mm -hmm. um, I always assume that before you go into the drone industry, you made probably a lot of market research about the industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm super curious to know where you see the drone market going in the next, let's say, five to 10 years. I know mm -hmm. it's a long time, but that, what would reality look like, let's say, in 10 years, mm -hmm. considered you know you are very sophisticated with the drone market? Mm -hmm. What we see, and, and I think this is uh, something that is definitely coming, that big enterprises will start to, or have already in-house drone operation departments. We already see this, that for example, in the US, big railroad companies actually hire 50, 100 uh, drone pilots mm -hmm. in, in, in their own in-house uh, company. So there is a big effort to, to basically 
do all the inspection and, and asset and maintenance work with drones. And I think another big uh, step or push will be to fly drones beyond visual line of sight so that, that all the activities, transport of goods, uh, we see this in Switzerland as well, we have this medical transport drone, we have in Africa uh, such such things going on. Beyond visual line of sight is a really big topic. Not so much for us because we are more or less contained in a, in a site that has a 3D structure. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's more the complexity of flying it. But uh, in general, uh, I think the commercial space will, will grow significantly and we are just in the beginning of this transition. The industrial revolution is also taking place uh, in this space, in the sure. drone space. But will it be, let's say, us getting on a drone flying from A to B? I don't think that this Autonomously, will be... Autonomously, yeah, obviously. Yeah. I don't think it... I mean, there are still a lot of regulatory changes uh, that have to be passed before uh, these kind of things are uh, accepted. So beyond visual line of sight is something that people are now doing with a lot of conversations with the authorities. We have the first startups that do some drone traffic management systems to integrate drones into the airspace. So, but this all takes time, especially mm -hmm. because you have to always have the legal departments or national uh, re regulators involved, and this takes time. Sure. What's interesting about your startup is that you set up your team in a way where partially your team is here in Zurich, mm -hmm. um, and the other part is in Ukraine. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. How is that working out? How come you made this decision? Yes. So we are basically three partners, and uh, we decided to have one partner, which is the CTO, the technical leader of our company, the R&D, to put this in Kiev. Uh, there are two reasons. So first, Switzerland is very expensive if you want to hire <laughs> as a startup developers. It's, it can be tricky yeah. to finance that. And the second one is I, I work with two Israelis actually yeah. and they originally uh, originate from Georgia and they speak fluently Russian. Okay. So in Ukraine this is, is a good uh, benefit yes. and the co-founder likes to live there. So it, it was a natural <laughs> choice in a way to outsource R&D to yeah. Kiev and it's working out well so far. We are now uh, starting to build up a team there. Yeah. So I could probably answer this question better in a few months <laughs> than you know how, how this is going. But sure. I'm excited to do this. Yeah. Sure. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the local startup ecosystem in the Ukraine uh, versus here, but how do you perceive, let's say, the, the ecosystem here, here in Zurich for startups? I feel there has been a lot of improvement in the last over, probably over 10 years. There are a lot of initiatives, good programs, accelerators, help you can get, especially if you come from the university and you want to do something, there is so much help. What I feel is, is lacking, if I compare it to Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv, is the VC spirit of taking risks. Yeah. So although you have very good people pools here, a lot of bright people that have nice ideas, often the money, the willingness to invest in, in, in bright ideas with some risk, arguable, arguably, is, is, is not here. And I think this is part of the Swiss culture. It's not uh, something natural, people starting a startup here in Switzerland. It's mm -hmm. more, much more common in Tel Aviv and also in, in Silicon Valley. Sure. So this spirit, I think, still has to change a bit. So you would like to see more VCs like do like the spread and pray? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, in terms of amount of money that is available to invest, yeah. but also in terms of, I'm, I'm not speaking from my company personally, but just seeing the spirit of investment here. It, it's, it's a lot of vetting, a lot of due diligence process. It's much more strict here, and the amount you can get is, is much less than in other, in uh, other countries. Uh, yes. How did you get your first paying client? I would say luck. Yes, <laughs> it was luck. We engaged with a service provider and basically they, they had a client that was interested. So it was luck, yes. What traits do you look for when you hire someone? For me, it's, it's the natural connection. If I feel, I, I believe I can f uh, feel from a person that I engage with 10, 15 minutes in a conversation, whether they are intelligent, whether they are smart and engaging and also honest. Mm -hmm. So this first impression for me is almost 80% of a decision that I make, yes. Sure. And then second would be skills or? I would say, I mean, in, in Kiev we basically also do some tests, of course, with the yes. engineers there, uh, how they perform, but uh, it, that's the second choice, yes. of course, yes. <laughs> sure. What's your best selling strategy? Well, I would say pitching the product, doing a demo of, of what, you, what your product can do. Also do market research, look what competitors can do and what they probably lack. So prepare yourself for a meeting with a, with a client. 
And I think Demo is, so far has been doing the best job for us, demoing the, the product. What's the most important character in an entrepreneur? I would say excitement and leadership for me, yes. I feel like this is something you need to have the daily uh, motivation to go in there and fight because it's much tougher than going to a regular daily job. <laughs> so every day you will have drawbacks, you will have beatdowns and you just have to get up again. Yeah and take the highs and the lows as good as you can. So. Sure. What's most important to you in an investor? Since we are, we are raising money, we, we have been recently engaging with a lot of VCs. And most importantly, I feel for myself is that I realize this guy's, guy knows the, the market. We are not interested in a, in a VC that just has money but doesn't know the market. We want to have somebody that really understands the market and can help us also with, with his connections, with his network, Open with indoors. his knowledge, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very important. Martin, now is your moment to leave the legacy for the next 10 years, no, for the rest <laughs> of your life, and to give us some advice about where you feel you're an expert for future generations. Mm -hmm. So take it away, you have about 30 seconds to, to give us like your wisdom. Okay, so I think if you're interested in uh, creating a startup, uh, most importantly is engage as early as possible with possible future customers, clients. Talk to them, go have a coffee with them, even if you don't have a product, if just have an idea, spin it around, learn what they think about it, try to find out what would they probably be willing to pay, just to validate your idea. Because from my experience myself, we, we had in the beginning different ideas and we were in front of actually some jury, startup jury, and they asked us, so what, what do the customers tell you about your idea and we were, you know, okay, we haven't really <laughs> talked to them. Yeah. And that was, you know, a, a lesson learned. Early learning. So, yes. <laughs> so do that. Yes. Very good. Martin, thank you so much for being on thank the show you for today. Having me. Thank you very much, everybody who stayed all the way till the end of this video. Make sure to stay a few more seconds for the preview for next week and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day. My name is James Oppenheim. I'm CEO and co-founder of Data Crushers. Be sure to tune in next Monday and subscribe.